It's a little hard to believe that Unreal Tournament is now 25 years old. I still have a fond and vivid memory of asking my mom to buy me the original Unreal back in my local CompUSA in the summer of 1998 and being in awe of its unique packaging. I never once imagined that a quarter of a century later, the Unreal Engine would be the most ubiquitous game engine in the industry and that it would empower entire generations of games across multiple genres. In the 90s, I mostly loved the visual design and its shocking attention to detail when it came to world building. Unreal was like anything I had ever seen before, and it still stands as an excellent achievement in first-person shooters. Where would developer Epic Games go from there? If you had asked me all those years ago, a multiplayer-only shooter would not have been my answer. Multiplayer modes for FPS titles had come into vogue thanks to the likes of Quake, GoldenEye 007, and even Turok 2 Seeds of Evil, but no one had attempted to launch a game without a traditional campaign mode, excluding MMOs as they were something entirely different in the 90s. It was a big gamble back in 1999 to continue the Unreal Legacy with bot matches and online multiplayer, but it was one that ultimately paid off. The idea for a largely multiplayer-focused game came about from the deficiencies of the original Unreal's netcode. As was the style at the time, pretty much every FPS game launched with some form of online support, and Unreal came equipped with a pretty standard deathmatch component. It had solid maps and some very impressive bot AI, but was otherwise too basic to hold much interest. While modding was starting to take off, the netcode Epic had utilized wasn't getting the job done, and a decision was made to release an expansion pack to help remedy the situation. As an old Gama Sutra article by programmer Brandon Reinhardt explains, Epic Games had brought the team from Digital Extremes, co-developer of Unreal Tournament, into its offices to better compartmentalize what needed to be done. Digital Extremes was previously located in Ontario, Canada, and it made coordination difficult when trying to design the multiplayer expansion. When they were finally brought into the Epic offices in Raleigh, North Carolina, some groundwork was set for creating new gameplay modes, but one thing became apparent. Everyone had underestimated the scope of this project. Originally planned to launch in the same calendar year as the original Unreal, the newly titled Unreal Tournament Edition was delayed from 1998 to 1999 and was now being developed as a standalone title. The team was initially reluctant but it seemed the allure of breaking away from a strictly single-player game was too strong. It didn't hurt that Unreal was highly moddable out of the gate, which would allow fans to poke and prod at Unreal Tournament to their heart's content. In fact, the UI that Unreal Tournament launched with was a mod developed by Jack Porter for the original Unreal. Porter would later be hired by Epic Games. Now, I didn't actually get Unreal Tournament right as it released. Having come at the tail end of the year, I was more glued to my Nintendo 64, PS1, and their respective holiday lineups. It was the following year in 2000 where, after exhausting Perfect Dark all summer, I had gone to middle school and met a new friend who was obsessed with Unreal Tournament. He was talking up the game in its varied modes, and since I didn't want to feel left out, I told a white lie that I had owned the game. I even told him that I had a Game of the Year edition, although that wasn't an intentional lie. Before it was repackaged with a bunch of user mods in late fall 2000, the original Blue Box editions had a Game of the Year label on them. Anyway, since I didn't want to get caught in this lie, I went home that day from school and asked my mom to get me the game. I had to see what the fuss was about, especially since I was enamored with Unreal just a few years prior. I didn't realize the game was multiplayer only, but that didn't matter to me in 2000. I was just getting into online gaming, and Unreal Tournament was my gateway drug. That's really jumping the gun though, as online wasn't the first thing I did after installing the game. Once I saw that legendary flyby introduction cutscene, I got sucked into the world that Unreal Tournament was selling me. I wanted to know all of the lore and explore its deepest secrets as if my life depended on it. The first map I played was The Pit of Agony, a rather compact arena with some ramps, practically the game's entire arsenal, and a hidden redeemer on a ledge as well as stained glass windows painted with a nude lady. I don't bring that up to have a laugh, but to explain how much of an impression that left on 12 year old me. I had never seen anything like that in gaming before, and mixed with the rather relaxing techno music that stage has. It felt as if I had opened a portal into another dimension. This was the future. From there, my memory is actually a little fuzzy on how I managed to go down the Unreal Tournament rabbit hole. Through online matches, I wound up making a new friend, and he has remained one of my closest friends for the last 24 years. 
We would browse the internet through mods while chatting on ICQ Messenger, and I suppose through that, I started to dig into the modding subculture that evolved within the Unreal community. Trying to recount the entire history of that is a job far beyond my capabilities, but there was an entire cottage industry that cropped up around Unreal's modability. In fact, in the November 2001 issue of Maximum PC, lead designer Cliff Blazinski stated, Unreal Tournament would not have sold nearly 2 million copies if it did not have support from the community. We ship the very same tools that we use to build the game, and folks use these tools to realize their own visions of first-person action. Off the top of my head, I can recall mods such as Jailbreak, Chaos UT, Rocket Arena, and Infiltration. There's even this bizarre mod called Strangelove that lets you ride the game's ultimate weapon, the Redeemer. That's getting ahead of myself, though. Even before you dig into the modding scene or ways that you can tweak Unreal Tournament to your preference, there is an entire game here that is built off the foundation of the original Unreal. If there is one thing Epic Games nailed almost perfectly with its first foray into first-person shooters, it was the weapon selection. There are a few odd guns in Unreal that don't quite work in practice, but most of the arsenal was close to perfection and just needed a few tweaks to get there. That's where Unreal Tournament comes in. My all-time favorite gun of any FPS title, the Flak Cannon, is here, and it steals the show. Working at a faster click than its first iteration, and featuring a futuristic design, the Flak Cannon pulls double duty as a grenade launcher and a shotgun. It's so utterly ridiculous that when it showed up in 2023's RoboQuest, I became overjoyed that someone else remembered its glory. It's effective at practically every range, and while it does take skill to nail the parabola of its firing arc, the gun is devastating in the right hands. There's no wonder that in Unreal Tournament 2004, nothing was changed about the gun other than its aesthetics. Going on from there, the thing that has always stuck out to me is how well balanced Unreal Tournament's weapons are. The Enforcer Pistol, which would be a death sentence in most other shooters, fires fast and accurate enough that it could become your preferred weapon for an entire round. The Shock Rifle gets an amazing design overhaul from its Unreal counterpart, and mixed with its legendary alt-fire combo, it becomes an outstanding long-ranged rifle. The plasma gun might look like a Wagner power sprayer, but its continuous beam of green plasma will absolutely melt people when they're up close. Figuring out how to utilize each weapon and counter them when in opponent's hands is key to what makes Unreal Tournament so engaging. Unlike modern shooters that work with a practically unlimited arsenal where personal preference is king, Unreal Tournament forces you to become adept with everything so that you never run into a situation where you're outgunned. Obviously, running into combat with a melee-based impact hammer isn't smart, but if you're good enough, you can rack up some kills with it. An amazing selection of weapons wouldn't mean anything without incredible maps to use them on, and this is another element where Unreal Tournament shines. Some of the most iconic and memorable maps ever made exist here, including the likes of CTF Face, DM Deck 16, CTF Lava Giant, and AS High Speed. That last one is for a unique mode that Unreal Tournament popularized called Assault. To my knowledge, it is the first objective-based multiplayer mode for any online game, and it tasks players with doing more than just fragging each other all night. That is another element that drew me to Unreal Tournament versus something like Quake 3 Arena, which was released just a few weeks later. UT launched with six game modes. These included now genre staples Deathmatch, Team Deathmatch, and Capture the Flag. UT upped the ante by including Last Man Standing, a Deathmatch variant where you were given only one life, and then the aforementioned Assault mode, as well as Domination, a unique spin on Kink the Hill. Domination has players navigating a map to capture three points for their team and hold them as long as possible. Points are awarded for the number of points you have at any one time. With this wide selection of modes and an incredibly varied map set, Unreal Tournament was unparalleled in the PC space. Deathmatch is great and all, but when you get bored of that, it's exciting that you can jump to something else without leaving the game. You can spend entire evenings digging into single modes and never even experience the other aspects of Unreal Tournament. To this day, there is still such a tremendous amount of content here, even if every map isn't to the same quality. Assault in particular can practically act like a mini campaign of sorts. Two teams take turns attempting to assault a base, though the objectives to do so do change on each map. AS Overlord, for example, looks like a recreation of the Normandy Beach landing and tasks the assaulting team with working through trenches to disable an anti-aircraft gun. Defenders typically have the advantage in this mode, though maps are usually designed in such a way as to limit the viability of sniping. The same cannot be said of CTF Face, though the simplicity of that map calls back to 2-4 from Team Fortress. A sniper perch can make advancing difficult, but then Unreal Tournament has a unique item known as the Translocator. 
With this device, you can shoot a disc a great distance and then instantly teleport to it. If you're skilled enough, you can even perform a telefrag by teleporting right on top of someone. It's an ingenious way to tweak traversal through maps that are otherwise much larger than the typical multiplayer shooter. Rounding out the package is the absolutely incredible soundtrack that gives UT an ethereal atmosphere and calming vibe. Composed by Alexander Banden, Michelle Vandenbos, Andrew Sega, Dan Gardapi, Peter Hajba, and Taro Kosterma, it contains a mixture of laid-back synth tracks and more bombastic action songs. Everything is contained with a module system that is powered by the Unreal Engine, so songs can sync specifically to the maps they are played on. It's incredibly easy to get lost in the soundtrack without even playing the game, as the beats sound like stuff from the French house movement of the era. More than the game itself, however, Unreal Tournament is likely remembered for popularizing epic games and its Unreal Engine. While I can only really recall Tactical Ops Assault on Terror being a mod that turned into a retail project, the number of games released on the Unreal Engine is pretty large. Deus Ex made use of the technology to incredible effect, and one of the prototypes for Duke Nukem Forever was being built on it. There were a couple of Star Trek games that used it, and an old friend of mine actually had Nerf Arena Blast when I met him. I was shocked that it was just Unreal Tournament, but for children. While that seems quaint by modern standards, the popularity, modularity, and stability of Unreal Engine would carry Epic Games to supremacy in the following console generation. While I would love to talk about the console ports of Unreal Tournament, I only briefly played the PS2 version back in the day. I had tried a ROM for the purposes of this video, but that version is locked to 30 FPS and had some wildly inconsistent auto-aim. The PS2 version was a launch game in the US and as such, it doesn't have online support. Interestingly, it did feature mouse and keyboard capability, but the PS2 is very finicky about what devices it will accept. There's also iLink cable support for a pseudo LAN option, but the game is really just a compromised version of the PC iteration. On Dreamcast, things aren't dramatically better, but owners of Sega's console at least got proper online support, well in the US. There is also support for Sega's own keyboard and mouse peripherals, which at least replicate the PC experience somewhat. Both console ports lose out on Assault, however, and since you're unlikely to find anyone willing to play an uglier, slower version of the game in 2024, they really only exist as cultural relics from a bygone era. When I was first writing this retrospective, I was going to include something of a eulogy for Unreal Tournament following Epic Games' decision to delist all of the Unreal titles from digital storefronts in early 2023. Thankfully, an agreement was reached with the website Old Unreal, where freeware versions of Unreal Gold and Tournament are now readily accessible on the Internet Archive. Old Unreal has made a number of fan patches over the year that have improved the stability of UT for modern operating systems, and with a still thriving mod community, there has never really been a better time to get back into this multiplayer masterpiece. The dream would still be for someone like Night Dive Studios to remaster this game for modern consoles and include crossplay support but at least Unreal Tournament hasn't been lost to the sands of time. Unreal Tournament was massively important in the development of my tastes as a kid, and I will always hold it close to my heart. It's very unlikely we'll ever see a resurgence of the arena shooter, but we maybe don't even need one with how good UT still is. If anything I've said in this video has piqued your interest, I would implore you to download the game off the internet archive and give it a shot. If nothing else, it will show you just how generous gaming used to be at the turn of the century. You will never see a game as customizable as Unreal Tournament ever again.